Digital Marketing Radio, episode 116, Facebook Marketing Today. DigitalMarketingRadio.com Today's episode is brought to you by DeepCrawl.com. When you need a comprehensive website crawler that identifies and monitors how your site is performing through the eyes of a search engine, I recommend DeepCrawl. DeepCrawl gives a complete and accurate picture of the health of your website architecture and identifies where the gaps are. Get your free website crawl of up to 10,000 URLs at deepcrawl.com slash report. That's deepcrawl.com forward slash report. The big interview with David Bain. Today I'm joined by an internationally recognized expert in Facebook marketing. Someone who's an author at Inside Facebook and also been featured in the Wall Street Journal. He's the co-author and CTO of Blitzmetrics. Welcome to DMR, Dennis Yu. Pleasure, Dave. Thanks for having me. Oh, great to have you here. Um, well, you can find Dennis over at blitzmetrics.com. So that's blitz with a Z or a, or a Z, depending on which side of the pond you're on, I guess. Um, blitzmetrics.com. So, Dennis, how much has Facebook marketing really changed over the last 12 months or so? Well, David, I'd say in the last 12 months, it's gone from a spray and pray untargeted platform to one where sequential marketing and cross-channel marketing matter. So let me break that down because it sounds like a lot of buzzwords. Do you remember back in the day, maybe 15 years ago, the evolution of email marketing when you built a list and you just mailed everybody at the same time? That's kind of what Facebook was because people didn't target even though Facebook had the data and the capability to be able to target. So when you can treat your Facebook marketing as pinpoint and laser guided as you can with any of these other channels, as you, I know a lot of your audience, for example, they're SEOs and you know that for different keywords you're going to provide a different experience, it's the same on Facebook. The difference is that most of that personalization occurs through the paid channel. So Facebook has invested most of their analytics and ability to target and provide a premium customer experience through their ad systems. What that means is that you can tie in your web pixel. So anyone who's been to the site, you're going to match back to Facebook. Anyone that you have in your email system, it could be MailChimp, Constant Contact, Marketo, Infusionsoft, you're going to tie back to Facebook so that you can remarket. If they do something in one channel, then you can, like, let's say they don't open an email, then you can send another message on Facebook. If they do something on Facebook, then maybe you can get them to do something else, like have an email. So all of the, you know, sign up for the podcast, uh, buy something. So if you do anything on one channel, then you should try to do something else on another channel. So we think of Facebook not as this separate thing all by itself, stupid cat photos on Friday, but it's an amplification of all the things that you already are doing well. So what's already converting well? What audiences are already converting well? How do we reach those same audiences? And then how do we create lookalikes? So in the last six months in particular, that's, that means the new video ads, like the video uh, link ads. You have these dynamic product ads, which are an extension of multi-product ads, which are the carousel ads, like five ads all at once, right? You have the different kinds of app-based analytics. You have the 11 business objectives that Facebook will allow you to optimize to. And the list goes on. So all of those things, it's hard to keep up. Even I find I'm confused. We were just over at Facebook yesterday talking about the new things that are rolling out, like Instagram retargeting. Wow, if we get a chance to talk about that, right? What happens when you can retarget between Facebook and Instagram and vice versa? And, and be able to get clicks out of the carousel, right? Because the complaint was that people, you could engage them on Instagram, but you couldn't link out, right? But now right. you can. So the, the sum of all of these things for the people who are looking at this and saying, okay, I can't keep up all day long, like Dennis and Alex and these other people with Facebook stuff. What do I really need to know? How do I really prepare? Understand that whatever assets you have, in terms of your, let's say emails where you really are driving conversion, or you're really driving conversion on SEO, whatever you're really driving conversion on, you're going to find a way to use Facebook to amplify that. Vice right, versa, okay. if you're not successful already in one of these other channels, you're probably not going to find your first success on Facebook. So you're not going to find this get rich quick kind of thing where social media opens the world to you because there's 1.5 million you know, daily users or something like that, right? So you have, you've got to have a website that converts to begin with. If you don't have that, then yeah. t stop advertising. Stop spending money on advertising. Yep. <laughs> okay, so... It's always true. You've got to have a list. You've got to drive traffic to it. You have to nurture them. You start with an autoresponder flow. You start to get fancy about segmentation. Otherwise, if you think about all these other channels, some people are talking about all, you know, the Meerkat and Periscope and, 
and what have, like the new Snapchat ads. They're all following what Facebook's doing, but if you don't have that core funnel in place, if your plumbing's not good, you don't want to run water through it because it's going to leak all over. Absolutely. So that's all people really, if they can't stay for this whole digitalmarketingradio.com podcast, what they need to know is identify where, and this is something that we call the setup checklist. It's at blitzmetrics.com slash SCL. You're going to want to make sure you have all of your audiences in one place. That means using Google Tag Manager to tie together your Facebook pixels, your Google Analytics, your Google AdWords with auto-tagging enabled, your Google Webmaster Tools, and everything else that's driven by pixels in a single container. If that confuses people, you can read the guide on that. But if you miss, if you don't listen to the rest of this, the one thing you need to do is get your Google Tag Manager set up because then all the things that Facebook's rolling out, you're going to be prepared for. But you absolutely want to listen to the rest of this because there's so much more great stuff that it could become. I mean, just listen to Dennis there for the first five minutes or so. He's just um, a mine of information about Facebook, about lots of other areas of digital marketing as well. Um, so talking about Facebook, um, you mentioned that um, it be it has become a lot more highly targeted over the last 12 months or so. And obviously you mentioned that there are so many different tools <coughs> that they have brought out as well, that they're offering advertisers. Uh, but can any business be successful advertising on Facebook um, or is it really a business to consumer type environment that is most successful? Our favorite little secret about Facebook is it's fantastic for B2B because think about the fact that you have all this information about, about people and if you're super targeted by where people work and by what job titles they have and by the size of their company and their income and the magazines they read and all these things, you have this information. The reason you know we have it, with, and Facebook has it, is because you've put it in there, right? Consumers have put it in there. It's a big address book. It works for any vertical. So you think of Facebook not as a social network, but as a utility that just happens to have a funny website and Instagram and WhatsApp and Messenger. Those are the those are four of the top five apps, by the way, on uh, for, for Apple, right? So you're, you think of it as a giant database. That's the best way to think about Facebook. It'll work for anybody if you target properly. The reason why this targeting is, is becoming more powerful and actually essential is that the cost of the traffic's going up. It's because your organic stuff is getting squeezed. People complain about, oh, I have to pay because Facebook's not showing my stuff anymore. Well, it's not because they're trying to force you to spend money on ads. It's because you have to compete against all the other items that are competing for your news feed, right? David, think of all your friends. Think of all the things that, you're, that, that your friends are doing and how, how Facebook's trying to decide which of those items are going to be relevant to you. So right. I, believe, I believe that you can set up your own Facebook, custom Facebook advertising groups based upon your own email list. You can, you can upload your email list and, um, and target people based on that. Is, is, is that correct? Yes, and that's part of something that's called a custom audience. So um, follow-on question in relation to that. Um, you mentioned it can be just as good for B2B, but often people sign up to Facebook with their personal <coughs> email address, and perhaps the email addresses that business-to-business focused organizations might have is their corporate email address that they haven't actually signed up to Facebook with. Um, so how do you actually overcome that challenge? Well, you don't necessarily on the email matching, but know that most people have two or three email addresses. They have a primary email that they set in Facebook, and then they may have their work email. If you're going after a small biz market or one where it's not like enterprise IT corporate, then you'll still get a pretty good match, probably 50 or 60%. Right. If you're going after super high end, at like VPs in banking, recruiters at, at the highest level, then maybe you're only going to get a 20% match. So even if you don't match on email, you can still get custom audiences, which are remarketing, by having pixels that live on your landing page, right? Okay. So uh, your landing page, and as long as they use that laptop for something else and they're logged into Facebook, even though they're logged in as a different user, you can still remarket to them. So let's talk a little bit about mistakes. Um, what would you say are some of the biggest Facebook marketing advertising mistakes that businesses are making at the moment? The first one is the greedy marketer. And the greedy uh, bottom fishing marketer is looking only for immediate conversions, probably because AdWords has trained them to look on navigational terms or terms that are significant intent when they are ready to buy. Facebook, you don't necessarily know when they're ready to buy, so you have to engage them. And because it's higher up in the funnel, you have to do things to nurture them, to be able to send authoritative interesting content, like what you're doing with your 26-week program, right? 
And yeah. here with digital marketing radio, right? That's great. It's personal branding, right? We all need to do that. Then you drive them to some kind of lead magnet because I'll put in your email and I'll give you the 10 tips on how to whatever, right? Something that's worthwhile. And then you continue to nurture them all the way to here's our product. Hey, we have this special going on. We have this uh, higher price program. Here's the free one, but we got a $7 one. So that kind of sequencing, when we talk about sequencing, at the most basic level, there's two things. One <clears throat> is web retargeting. Web retargeting, you, you saw the, let, let's say you're a female and you saw those red high heeled shoes and they follow you around, right? <laughs> That's web retargeting, but you can do social retargeting. You can do email retargeting. The, the crappiest form of email retargeting is an autoresponder, right? Because it's dumb. It just follows you with a robotic set of messages. But if you think about Facebook, you can actually fine tune who gets what messages when. So that's the smartest kind of custom audiences. So when you talk about mistakes, the biggest mistake is to be a greedy marketer where you're only trying to poach those immediate conversions where they've already decided. At that point, all the keywords that they're searching on are already, it might even be too late, maybe they already decided, right? If you get these people well up in the funnel before they even search, maybe they don't even know the name of your product, maybe they have a need and they don't know the word for that, the phrase for that, right? Mm. You can, and if you're leveraging word of mouth, you never need to play in that bottom of funnel area except for like brand protection where you're bidding on your name on Google or you just have basic one day remarketing a card abandoners, that kind of thing. That's the, that's the one big takeaway. If you get that, I can go into five or six other things, but that's the big one. Wow. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sure we could talk for a long, long time, you know, but we've only got um, a, a set period of time here. So I'd like to fire <coughs> a, just a couple of more questions just to get your opinion here. Uh, one is actually in relation to how a brand positions itself when it's interacting on Facebook, because Facebook is quite a, a an informal social environment that, that people are interacting with their friends on. Does that mean that a brand should be quite lighthearted? in its approach generally on Facebook, um, or should a brand stick with its own consistent um, tone of voice? So there's really two extremes there. On one end is the super chummy brand that's trying to be your friend, and that's kind of like your mom going out to the movie theaters you know, with you with your friends and obviously not cool, right? Mm. And I think people recognize that there's something not right when brands try to pretend that they're your friends. Sometimes it can be done right, but often it results in a backlash. Like you see, you know, it's happened with Coca-Cola and some of these other guys. Yeah. On the other hand, you want to think of this as personalization, not because you're trying to be, you're, you're trying to force your way into a conversation. You're trying too hard. But if you've targeted the right people, if you know what you stand for, then you're drawing people in. And I know that's a, that's kind of a subtle distinction, but the point of inbound marketing is. <clears throat> If you have your why defined, and your why is not to make money, your why is not to sell a better um, industrial pipe or whatever it is that you actually do. It's the why, right? You know, you have the why, the how, and the what. If yeah. your why, that mission, passion, reason for existence is super clear, it'll attract the right people, and those people will attract other people. So you never have to worry about the messaging because the messaging is the amplification of what your best customers say. You're okay. turning the funnel upside down. Instead of a funnel like this, you start, you're, you've got an hourglass, right? It goes yeah. to the funnel here, audience engagement conversion, right? Top, middle, bottom. And then you have the word of mouth funnel, which start, starts at the bottom of the funnel because then your best customers are the ones who engage these other people. These engaged people create awareness for this broader audience. So most people play in this, this kind of triangle. <clears throat> Social media plays, and Facebook plays in this reflective triangle on the bottom. You know, the, the, the tip, <coughs> excuse me, you got the tip of the iceberg here and then you have the the bot you know the bottom ninety percent the real power of the iceberg is that word of mouth wow. influence because David Bain likes it well I'm going to trust that way more than some brand trying to come up with this interesting jingle that an ad agency came up with absolutely but of course only ten percent or perhaps even less of businesses are actually doing that and doing it correctly most businesses I guess now on Facebook are, are still making the mistake of just treating it as a yeah. direct advertising opportunity and driving people back to their site from that campaign. Do everything that you would do in real life and see if it works. If you and I were having dinner mm. and we're talking about whatever we're talking about and some random person comes up and says, excuse me, I really think you should buy this. If you act now, you know, this thing expires today, you'd look at this guy and say, who are you? Get out of here, right? But if someone came in and then, uh, let, let's say, you know, you and I were having dinner and this guy comes in and I say, oh, wow, 
you know, uh, hey, Jillian, it's so good to see you. I haven't seen you in a couple of years. Why don't you come join us? And, and wow, let's catch up. Hey, hey, David, is that cool, right? She's the mom of Rand Fishkin, right? Let's sit down and, and talk. And you're like, oh, yeah, sure. And then she says, oh, I'm launching this new company. Mm. You want to hear about it? And you say, well, yeah, of course they do. You see, that's the difference. It's like at the so, beginning of this um, interview before we went live, uh, we were talking about microphones and um, um, I, I was recommending a microphone and you're typing into Amazon and um, um, that's a one-to-one -one personal recommendation. So um, you're much more likely to take action on that than just seeing an ad for a microphone. Yeah, you know, Michael Jordan and George Foreman could say that that's their favorite microphone, but who are you going to trust? You're going to yeah. trust a celebrity who obviously is being paid or you're going to trust your friend's recommendation. So think about the last... 30 decisions that you probably made in the last 24 hours that you probably didn't even think about. Mm. How many of them were involved by a social touch? Because okay. your friend ate there. Because someone recommended that that was the one to get versus like, even the most micro decisions, like which uh, item you order on the menu. Or, I mean, just th that kind of thing, right? When I did analytics at Yahoo, we saw, I think I told you, 70% of the people three hours to dinner time had not yet decided where they're going to go eat. Right. How do they decide, right? So what time is it over where you are right now? Have it you had is, yet? Yeah, absolutely. It's half past 10 at night, yeah. Half past 10. Okay, well, so let's say, uh, you know, 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock or so. Did you know what you were going to go eat? Or what you'd have for dinner? <laughs> no, no, because my, my wife was making it, so that's okay. something different. Yeah. But then you go back to, you know, did, did she decide and what influenced her? Maybe she saw yeah, something yeah. on Instagram or, you know, mm. that kind of thing. And so what you want to do is influence that. But if you don't have your tracking in place, you won't be able to figure out the power of that influence and that's why these pixels are so important to put in place so you can figure out when you're able to touch these other people who influence these other folks okay so so pixels putting into place these pixels you're obviously talking about re <laughs> retargeting there I, I presume um so if that's the case do you think retargeting is the most powerful form of marketing on facebook at the moment and also um in relation to that um what's the best way of actually running a retargeting campaign would you actually use the native advertising facility within facebook or would you use a third-party supplier like adro perfect audience to actually manage that campaign for you i don't want to piss off a lot of people because <laughs> i if i had a nickel for every time i i got asked this question it would be a different story and i don't want to piss off facebook either because i was just over there at facebook and uh, yesterday and got a tour of their new building 20 and all these things here mm. let me give you a, a slightly political but still honest answer okay if you don't have a lot of time and you can only put in one pixel to cover Google remarketing, Facebook remarketing, Twitter remarketing, the other kinds of remarketing, fine. Do an ad roll, uh, do a perfect audience, do one of these other guys. But if you don't mind putting in two pixels, Google and Facebook, do that because you're not going to pay the 40% markup. You're going to get access to features before these other guys do. Unless you're super sophisticated and you've exhausted native retargeting, so you're not competing against yourself with other display networks and this kind of thing, which you can do, but it's a, it's a super sophisticated kind of thing, mostly like pure e-com and app plays, I wouldn't touch any of that because I think that I know that Google and Facebook have been taking this stuff in-house. This is why Facebook came out with dynamic product ads. The reason why Facebook opened up FBX, which was the exchange to allow third parties to sell remarketing, is that they didn't have the logic built in beforehand to be able to figure out what items to send to what people when they went to this page, when they did this one thing, right? So it made sense to work with a dozen remarketing providers to do that until they eventually figured out how to do it, which is now the carousel ads with dynamic product ads, where the system does the optimization. The system determines the logic of who is going to see what. That's where the power is. So if you're going to set up remarketing properly and you don't mind rolling up your sleeves just for an hour, learn this thing, I promise you it's worth the investment, or just have one of our kids do it, right? 20 bucks an hour, have them do it, yeah. whatever. Or download our training and have one of your kids do it, I don't care, right? Point is, just do it, you don't have to pay us. Just pay someone to do it or just do it. And then you're gonna find that you're gonna place one pixel now on your site for Facebook. You no longer have to have a, a site-wide custom audience pixel, and then a conversion pixel on a lead or a checkout, or you know they landed on this one page or they watched this video or you, you have one pixel just one and then that one pixel can drive any of 27 different events they clicked a certain button they finished watching a video they added to the cart they did you know all this kind of stuff because those are those, those are all basically event tracking just like you have with google right so 
it's not driven by the page load, it's driven by the click. So if that's not too technical for people, what that means is that <clears throat> you want to think of remarketing at the most granular level. What are the actions? Like literally, what are people clicking on that are the most important things in the journey that you have mapped out? If you can identify that, then what are you going to say next? Right? The whole point of a sequence is something happens, David. Then what happens next? What do you want to happen next? And if they don't do that thing, then you're going to hit them in email. You're going to hit them in Google remarketing. You're going to hit them with Facebook remarketing. But you got to have the content to hit them next. If you don't have the content, no amount of targeting and sequencing is going to matter, right? You have to draw out the sequences saying, here's the path of this kind of user, our mom. Here's the path of our frequent buyer. Here's the path of the wealthy executive who's busy and travels a lot. Here's the path of whatever it is, right? And then what am I going to say to each of these people to build trust, not because of what I said, but I'm going to put content based on what other people said because it was written up in the Wall Street Journal, right? That's what we've done. Because Facebook puts out our checklists and says, this is how you should do it if you're a sports team. Right? So we don't have to say anything. We say, go look at what Facebook said. Oh, and they just happened to say, use our checklist. Right? Mm. So your remarketing is only as good as your content marketing, which is funny. Right. Okay. So in one word, um, should every single business that's online and doing some form of marketing activity be retargeting? Yes. If they have content to give to people and if people are willing to share Right, it, like if you're a plastic surgeon, it's going to be tough to get remarketing going on properly, or you, because uh, no one's going to allow to admit that they have before and afters, right? So should you not re retarget directly to a strong call to action? Um, book this, uh, buy this. Should you retarget <coughs> towards content? You should, but remember, the the more retargeting rules you have, the more sequences you have. The more sequences means the more content you have to have, right? Mm. Let's say you have two different kinds of audiences. And then you have three or four items in each sequence. Now all of a sudden you got a grid, two, two times six. Then let's say you got 10 kinds of audiences, and then you've deepened your remarketing to have 10 different things along the way. Now all of a sudden you've got a 10 by 10 grid of 100 bucket, you know, a bucket with 100 things in it, right? Wow. Well, listen, I'm sure, I could <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I could keep, keep on talking to you about Facebook for the next two hours or so, but um, I'm sure also you've got some... Uh, very strong, great opinion on other areas of digital marketing. So let's segue into the second section of our discussion. So that focuses more on your thoughts on what's happened in digital marketing in the past and what's happening now. So starting off with software, I couldn't live without. So what software do you currently use in your business that if someone took away from you, it would significantly impact your marketing success? There's two or three of them. And I'll bet you almost nobody uses these. Boomerang is my number one and I'm not I, paid. I don't I get, get a referral. But that's how we keep track of things in email. Now, this pre-assumes you have your emails under control. If your email's under control and you inbox zero your stuff, then that helps you. That reminds you if so so and so didn't reply after so and so number of days, and it has been a lifesaver. So that's one. And then number two, and that's I think they charge like ten bucks a month or something like that. Number two, it's it's a free one. It's the Ghostery plugin for Chrome, mm. and it shows you all the pixels that are on anybody's site on your site on someone else's site. So if you're an agency, if you're a consultant, you absolutely want that. It's just like Firebug, except it tells you more things in a certain, in a different way. And it's, it's so easy to find when certain pixels are missing in certain areas because you're trying to troubleshoot. Oh, I had the developer build this one thing, but they forgot to put the pixel in, and that's why our conversions weren't showing. Or how come our custom audiences weren't loading there? Oh, it's because the, the, or our conversion rate showing too high because the, the pixel is actually on the landing page instead of on the thank you confirmation page. Or, there's always dumb stuff like that. I mean, you 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 guys are probably thinking, oh no, that never happens with me. I I always, you know, my guy is on top of his stuff. Wait till you try this and thank me later. But yeah, the second one is is Ghostery, which is completely free. And then the third one will be in Infusionsoft because that's how you're going to set up the sequencing outside of social because you social is only as good. I know a lot of people argue with me, but social is only as good as your ability to collect an email address. If you don't collect that email address, you have no ability to continue that retargeting except to pay for it every time. And then you can't bring email back to social because if your email sequencing is strong, remember we said how sequencing works, you're going to mm -hmm. use opportunities. When they engage with you in email, you're going to try to bring them out to social if they're not a fan, if, uh, to watch, bring them out to see a video, bring them out to – you're going to constantly – you're going to try to cross that channel as quickly as you can. Right? So why, why do you go for <coughs> Infusionsoft, Infusionsoft rather than some other marketing automation tool? So Infusionsoft is really three things. It's a shopping cart, it is an email marketing tool, 
and it's a CRM. I think if we were honest, we'd agree that Infusionsoft is not amazing at any one of these three, such that there's so many things in there that people call it Infusionsoft. They get mad if I say that, right? But if you're a small biz and you don't have a whole IT team to do a lot of integration, then it makes a lot of sense. And then at some point, you have to step into the API. At some point, you have to get outside of Customer Hub and start to go into like Optimize Press or other tools, lead pages, right, to be able to extend beyond what they can handle. There is no one single tool that mm. handles the whole thing. Why? Because even the fanciest marketing automation tools, like a Marketo, they don't cover the social side. They say they do because they bought social companies, but they don't. They don't cover the analytics properly. They, they don't cover the advertising side to be able to amplify against the remarketing. Interesting. Um, and I like this next question as well. It's a slightly more challenging question, actually. What piece of software don't you use, but you've heard good things about and you intend to try at some point in the near future? I like Adespresso. Adespresso, and it, the reason why I haven't been using it is we haven't found it necessary to do mass multiplication of, of ads, right? And the same could be true because you could look at AdStage or Marin if you're a corporate marketer or Kenshu. Mm -hmm. These are all guys in the same category where they, and there's nothing wrong, you know, I love Larry Kim of WordStream. I actually have used this tool. I think it's fantastic. I just haven't used it recently, you know? Mm -hmm. But I know it is, I know what it does and I've used it before, I just haven't used it recently. All these tools have something in common. The ability to scale and refine off of something that's already working. Because think about these PPC tools. If you don't already have a converting path, if you, like if you don't have, let's just say for example, you don't have a landing page that works. Do you think any amount of like choosing more keywords and optimizing bids is going to change that? Any amount of like ad copy or images is going to change that if your landing page sucks? Yeah, no, of course right? not. And we found that through remarketing and Facebook ads, and, and uh, well, we don't do just Facebook ads, but we're known for that. We do all the other channels too. But we found that the, the ability to be really pro at PPC tools is becoming, I don't want to say that you're a dinosaur and don't need to do anymore, but it's becoming less necessary because the multiplication of content and sequencing is done outside. You see that these PPC tools don't need to understand, they don't understand sequencing. They need to if they're going to optimize because P PPC tools are built upon a one stage conversion, right? And you don't have enough data to repeat the same thing over and over again or to multiply in other keywords or what have you. Plus, the bid optimization and the sub-targeting is already done when you bid to an objective, right? Whether it's to uh, Facebook for optimized CPM or it's, it's, it's Google for, uh, you know, bidding to a CPA, it's the same thing. So they're, mm. they're taking that away from the third-party tools. So we've, we've not found it necessary because just by following simple principles, we don't need to go that far even though the tools will try to sell you on the, you know, because it's complicated, because it'll save you time, because you'll make instant profits. They, they try to sell you on that, but we find in 99% of the cases, it's something fundamental that's wrong with goals, content, or targeting. Something's wrong there. The tools can't fix that. Well, you've mentioned some great tools there, so I'll include them within the show notes at digitalmarketingradio.com. So moving on to... I wish I would have. I'd like you to look back on the very first day that you're involved in trying to market a business online. What didn't you do so well? What do you wish that you would have done differently? Oh... This is embarrassing. <laughs> it was back in 1997, and I put American Airlines on the web to be able to sell tickets. Wow. And our launch date, I want to say, was May something, and we lined up four or five million dollars of advertising budget. I had a full page ad in USA Today, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, millions of dollars of advertising. I spent millions of dollars building this website, and it the website didn't work. And I learned a lot because I learned not to trust vendors that are not truly technical or they're doing things like Oracle told us that we were the first ever to do multi-mastering, which means having multiple databases keep in sync. See, it, I know today it's not a big deal with database replication and hot standbys, but back then, remember, this is almost 20 years ago. Mm. The idea of having two databases that you kept in sync. So let's say that you, you were a, a big company and you had a data center on the West Coast and a data center on the East Coast like we did. Well, if you sell a ticket and it shows up in this database, it's got to show up in this other database at the same time because you can't sell the same ticket twice. How do you keep that up, up to speed, right? And so it's easy with two, but then we had to make it work on three. And trying to triangulate between three is not just a little bit harder, it's exponentially harder. And I quickly realized that the whole world of web software 
was not as easy as just out of the box because I bought Oracle and Kana and Broad Vision and ATG and I think I mentioned, yeah, we went we went from upgrade from, well, not necessarily upgrade, but we went from DB2 as our database platform over to Oracle, right? Because it was better at analytics, it was more expensive, but the idea of Oracle Enterprise Manager and the database cleaning up after itself wasn't as smart. We went, we invested in a couple middleware layers to be able to talk back to the call center and talk back to the database and to Sabre to be able to book flights, all of these things. And pretty soon I realized I was an integrator when really I came in as a, a guy who was just supposed to be able to sell tickets on the web. All of a sudden, I had to try to connect all these different systems. And I feel like 20 years later, we're back in the same place. Don't you feel like that, David, where you, ha you have to master like 20 different tools and time yeah. to get Yes, absolutely. Um, it's 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 funny. You know, I was I was listening to what you were saying back then. In 1997, that's um, before Google even existed, um, yeah. and um, I, I actually started my first business online in the year 2000, and um, that that involved uh, providing restaurants with an online booking service. Mm -hmm. And the way that we offered that service is we actually <laughs> were fairly novel about it. Um, people had to register on our site, um, they filled in their details, and we had a record of their details from that. And whenever a booking was made, we took their information, turned it into an email, and used a faxing service actually in the UK because every restaurant oh, that, had, a, yeah. had a fax. Um, yeah. So as soon as that booking was made, you know, a minute later, the, the restaurant received a fax, and then the restaurant was able to actually phone back that person and then, uh, and, and then confirm the booking with them. So to the person booking online, that was an online booking service, and, and it, it worked really well. But it's, it's tying things together with uh, string and sellotape, really, isn't it? It's funny is that it brings you back to the human element. And mm -hmm. as much as we've tried to hide, or not we, I'll, I'll say me, people like me have tried to hide behind technology because of all the tools and data and whatever. It sounds cliche-ish, but at the end of the day, it's about these people, and we forget about the people relationships, and that causes people to act in really awkward, funny ways online that they'd never act in the real world. And for all these marketers and business owners that are listening to the Digital Marketing Radio podcast, think about the same thing. If you're ever confused, go back to what it looks like if you were to actually sit down with that person, what would you say to them? And you'll have the answer. Hmm. It's not about edge rank or quality score or some kind of algorithmic thing. It's never about that. Great, great advice. Um, I just wanted to to pause there for a second and just <laughs> soak the advice in myself, you know, because it's um, so, so right. You know, um, too many people look at look at metrics and uh, just think of just um, everything as a metric and, and they don't get to know people and um, you have to really understand people to engage with them and, and, and really get them loving your brand and what you do. You know it's funny David, do you remember back in 2008, 2009, all those ads that were on Facebook inside the apps on like who has a crush on you and what's your IQ and all that? Yeah, absolutely. Most of that was run by our ad server. <laughs> At one point, we were running 100 million impressions a day. We were bigger than Google AdSense on Facebook because AdSense didn't know how to serve ads in that in a social environment, right? Mm -hmm. So we were serving 100 million impressions a day, and we were making up to $80,000 a day in revenue. On our ads, this was not Facebook ad system. This is before Facebook ever had an ad system, right? Mm -hmm. And to your point, I was thinking, wow, look at all these clicks. Look at the traffic. Uh, we have 13% traffic coming from Canada, 7% coming from Australia. Uh, here's the ads that are working. So I was just thinking completely in an optimization, giant spreadsheet kind of thinking way, right? Yeah. And then I realized, wait a minute, and this, this thing nearly made me like faint or drop to my knees. I realized, wait, behind every one of those clicks is a human being. Yes. So if there were a million clicks, at some points we were doing over a million clicks a day, Wow, that's a million people. Can you imagine a million people all in the same room pressing click at the same time? That's like if everyone in China were to jump up and down at the same time. Yeah. Right? And when you think that way, it creates a level of humanity and care that it puts you in the right mind to be a sequence marketer, a relationship, you know, dating all the way to marriage and, you know, courtship kind of relationship marketer, not a social media technical gadget, gadget SEO, you know, edge rank, Google algorithm marketer. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's, it ties back to every aspect of 
producing content online as well. Because yeah. I mean, I've got a, a few YouTube videos that have done fairly well, maybe 70, 80,000 views for, for individual videos. And it, it perhaps, you know, doesn't feel anything special at all. But if you imagine 80,000 people in a stadium all yeah. watching your content, then that puts it into reality, really. It's just it's quite incredible. It's so humbling. Mm. I came out of a meeting with Facebook yesterday when I was telling you, and they were showing all these stats. And I was impressed because they were talking about some of the stats for WhatsApp and Instagram, which I'm not allowed to share, but they're impressive, right? You can imagine what they are. And then I walked into the subway to go back up to San Francisco, right, the bar, and I saw a billboard inside, and it says, I'm looking for your dream job? Someone else is competing for that too, is basically what it said. And I thought, how close-minded, how Cold War, zero-sum, red ocean, it's either me or you. If you get it, then I don't get it. And if I get it, then you don't get it kind of mentality, right? Yeah. And I think that's exactly, and it was at, from a university. I think it was like University of San Francisco or something. And they're saying, you need to enter our executive MBA program because this other, the other candidates are going to get the edge on you and they're going to get the job. And that's exactly the wrong kind of thinking. You need to be successful today, not just in digital. But I think to be successful in business, because if you define your personal brand, if you're openly sharing, did you expect to get 70 or 80,000 people to watch your YouTube videos? Or were you, you, and I bet you, you, we weren't selling anything either, were you? Because if you were, I, I, you wouldn't get that many people watching it and sharing it. No, I wasn't. Um, I mean, I gave people the opportunity um, to go on and find out more about a paid program afterwards, but um, the videos that had those kind of views um, were about an hour and a half long of yeah. pure content. Yeah. And you're sharing your best stuff. You weren't holding back. No. You weren't playing the secrets game. Yeah. And that's what everyone needs to realize is that when you do that, you're not helping the competitors or any of that kind of stuff. The, the benefit you get from customers appreciating this and telling everybody is way more than any kind of negative competitive consequence. And if you don't produce that kind of content, you can't do your sequencing anyway. That's like trying to play a song with only one note. Your, your piano has one note. What kind of song can you play? Absolutely. Um, I just um, interviewed actually um, a lady called uh, Alexandra Tachlova um, last night, and, and that's um, going to be the podcast episode before yours, um, Digital Marketing Radio episode um, 115. And what she was saying was, um, it's, it's not important for you to get thousands and thousands of visits to your website. It's all about relationships and that one-on-one that, that -on -one relationship can be the most important thing to your business. Um, and and I, I'm really excited that digital marketing um, in general has, has to a certain degree uh, reverted to traditional, ethical, uh, long value, long standing um, marketing activities that, that work rather than actually fly by night, drive thousands of visitors yeah. to your site and hopefully just get a few of them to buy something from you. Yeah. And if anything, the bad marketers, right, the traditional marketers that just rely upon cold calling and this kind of stuff, they're getting penalized and they're the ones who are complaining. It's funny, right? Because the fact that there's more data and there's more user feedback that's built into the system to penalize those people who don't market well, it's kind of funny because those people who are complaining, without even listening to them, you can almost already tell that they're practicing the wrong techniques. It's like they buy a new car, they don't know how to drive, they crash into the wall, and then they blame BMW, Yeah. right? And in this world of a relationship marketing, it's so easy to think that we're just one click away. You can use this one kind of app. But when you reached out for an interview, it was because you saw that we had so many friends in common and you saw that there's something that we could talk about. And that, so that, that was based on humanity. It wasn't based on some kind of inception to get you to reach out. Yeah. And then what happened? I went and I saw you in London. Yes. It was about the human connection. It makes right. it so much easier, and, and we're having a great conversation. And um, because of the fact that we've we've met as well, it, it makes it so much easier just just building that relationship. And then hopefully the audience will feel that and actually <coughs> get more from that as well. Yeah. So it's not just two random people. I'll give you another example as a takeaway for the other people here. So when you go to a conference, it's so easy to play the hungry, hungry hippo. Let me collect as many business cards and shake as many hands as I can. Game, right? Mm. But to your point, quality instead of quantity. I find it's more important. I probably take it to the extreme because I give out, on average, I give out none or I give out one business card per conference, right? It's better to make one or two real connections that you maintain over the long run than getting 50 business cards and taking selfies with these famous people 
and then later they have no idea who you were. They don't, you don't know who they were. It's just a stack of business cards you look at from last year and you throw them away. Yes, yeah, I, and we've we've all been there, but um, we need to improve. And 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 you're certainly doing things the right way. And I'm I'm trying to get there as well. And uh, hopefully we'll be, I'll be moving in the right direction and in, in the future. Uh, but. I t- tell you what, let's move on to the, the the next round, which is the this or that round. So that's the quick response round. Ten quick questions and just two rules here. Try not to think about the answer too much, and you're only allowed to say the word both on one occasion. Ready to go with this? Okay. Email or Twitter? Email. Audio or video? Video. Affiliates or display advertising? Display. Facebook or Google Plus? Oh, Facebook. Online press releases or one-on-one relations? One-on-one relations. Paid search or SEO? Both. Email contact form or telephone number? Email contact form. Website or app? Website. Social subscriber or email subscriber? Email subscriber. And local marketing or global marketing? Oh, I don't know how to answer that one. Depends on what your business is. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> See, most people normally leave the both to 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 last there, but um, I think you had it in was it was it paid search or SEO? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so do you think you've you every business has got to do both of them if possible? You do because you you use paid search to to taste it, right? So let's say you go into the restaurant and there's five different meals. You don't know if they're good. You're going to buy it before you actually decide to cook it, right? It's it's uh, you're going to rent that car before you decide to buy it. That's the because it takes a lot of effort to, to rank for it, and then you don't even know how it's going to perform. Is it even worth it? I ranked number two on the keyword Facebook advertising a few years ago organically, right? Yeah. Was it any good for for us? No, it wasn't. It drove yeah. us all kinds of requests we didn't want to hear. That's 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 incredible. The ten thousand dollar question. If I was to give you ten thousand dollars and you had to spend it over the next few days on a single thing to grow your business, what would you spend it on, and how would you measure success? I would do video interviews mm. and use Facebook workplace targeting on them. Wow. Okay. That's unique. Okay. Um, I didn't do people like you, Maximum Impact, and I push it out to the press. That's incredible. Okay. Um, um, I, I, I haven't. Like you never believe. So 116, I haven't had that response before. So I, I like having unique, different responses. So <laughs> thank you so much for that. My number one takeaway. Well, uh, Dennis, you've over-delivered. You've just given so much information, and I really thank you for that. So um, what is the best way for our audience to find out more about you and what you do? So I'm the checklist king, and I want you to follow these checklists and go through them and give me feedback. Go to blitzmetrics.com slash... GTM, which is Google Tag Manager, right? GTM, and start there, and then you're going to learn about how to do Facebook for a dollar a day. You're going to learn about the setup checklist. You're going to learn about personal branding, which is slash PBG, right, for personal branding guide. I want everyone to go through these checklists, and if you find something that really resonates with you, you don't have to go through everything in all these checklists, right? There's lots of, lots of stuff, but maybe there's, there's something that catches your eye. Go through it and tweet at me. Right or or talk about it on LinkedIn or email me. Right, I said email was more important every time you gave me that choice. Dennis at blitzmetrics.com. Right, I want to see your success. I am here because I want to. I don't care about me. I'm here because I want to see everyone be successful based on some obvious things that we have learned through making lots of mistakes with other people's money. Great. Okay. Well, I'll make sure that I have also links to all those resources that you mentioned uh, within the show notes on digital marketing radio so um listeners can just go to that and uh, please get in touch with dennis and um tell him you know what you've done as well and um and form that relationship you know, it's all about relationships thank you again dennis it was wonderful thank you david thank you everybody well and thank you dear listener for joining us um if you'd like um to hear more and if you like what you heard uh, i'd really appreciate your feedback so just go to digitalmarketingradio.com slash itunes and please leave an honest rating and review it would be absolutely fab to hear from you and of course it would help to improve the ranking of the show on itunes and finally i'm also hosting a brand new live show every friday called this week in organic so head over to thisweekinorganic.com to find out more about that But that's all for now. So until we meet again, adios. See you later, Dennis. Thanks again. Thanks, David.